there can be no doubt of the fact that England's success in the Hundred Years' War were attributable almost solely to the combination of longbowmen and dismounted men-at-arms that she fielded on almost every occasion, a combination which had evolved from experience gained in the field in actions against the Scots during the early decades of the 14th century. Bannockburn and similar encounters had taught them the uselessness of cavalry, when confronted by determined close-order spear-armed infantry, and soon they began to emulate the Scottish practice of dismounting their men-at-arms. The same bitter experiences, also taught them to appreciate and fully utilize the devastating power of the longbow, which led in turn the evolution of the characteristic English battle formation, of dismounted men-at-arms between forward-angled bodies of archers, that was deployed for the entire duration of the war. Geoffrey Le Baker's chronicle written on 1357-1360, includes observations that the English had been mostly accustomed to fighting on foot, imitating the Scots ever since Stirling, by which he means Bannockburn, and despite a contradictory statement elsewhere in his work, that Halidon Hill was the first battle where the English men-at-arms fought on foot, in conscious imitation of the Scots, it is clear that the English had began to dismount by the 1320s at the latest. The Lanacost Chronicler says that the practice began in 1322 at Borough Bridge, while Froze saw records of Edward III's 1327 expedition that encountering the Scots, the English were ordered to dismount and take off their spurs, and drew up in three battles. Once dismounted, they drew up in close array tighter than that of the French, is evident from remarks in contemporary sources, such as Frosar, who says of the English formation at the minor engagement of Norjan in 1359, that they kept so closely together that they could not be broken. Similarly at the combat of the Thirty, the Anglo-Bretons fought shoulder to shoulder so tightly, that the French were unable to separate them. As for the depth of their formation, at Argincourt, they drew up four deep, but presumably where more men were available, deeper formations might be utilized. The French in turn, began to dismount their men-at-arms in the 1340s, Saint Paul de Leon, seemingly being the first battle in which they do so. Baker reports that at Poitiers, where they may have done better if they remained in horseback, the French dismounted. Ironical enough on the advice of a Scottish knight in their service. Despite the many recognized tactical advantages of the charging horsemen, in particular the ability to induce fear, panic and flight among dismounted troops, cavalry were thereafter little used in battle in France and England, though they finally underwent something of a revival on the 15th century, largely brought about, it has been argued, by the adoption of the Ayat de Quirice. This gave the lance greater rigidity on impact thereby imparting greater penetration which was necessary to counter the heavier armor worn for protection against arrow fire. Despite however, of whether or not, they remained in the saddle once reached the battlefield, heavy cavalry remained a nucleus of most European armies throughout the period. As already started, English men-at-arms drew up with bodies of archers positioned on their flanks, this formation seemed to have been first employed at Dublin Muir in 1332 and proved such a success, that it was repeated at Halladon Hill the next year, but with the significant difference, that instead of there being just one such body, the army was instead divided into three divisions, the traditional three battles of all medieval armies, each with its own forward angle flanking archers, so that when drawn up side by side, wedges of archers were established. This was the formation used virtually unchanged thereafter for the duration of the war. It was usually drawn up before or between woods, or hedgerows, so that it was difficult for horsemen to attack from flank or rear. Occasionally small holes were dug to the front as a further defensive measure, another trick probably learned from the Scots. Baker says that at Cressy the English dug a large number of pits in the ground near the front line each a foot deep and a foot wide, so that if the French cavalry approached, their horses would stumble in the pits. This same precaution was still being employed even in the war's closing stages, being utilized for example, at Formingy in 1450. The word hearse, used by contemporary chroniclers to describe the wedge-shaped formation of English archers. Frosar uses it for instance, to describe their array at Cressy. 
Its derivation is uncertain and though it was generally thought to have been named after the continental harrow, another possible derivation is from the French harrition, meaning a bristly fence or a hedgehog. The wedge-like form of the hearse of archers is confirmed by a French chronicle, which describes the archers at Cressy as drawn up in the shape of a shield. Sir John Smythe, writing in 1590, gives fuller details, though mistakenly assumes that a single wing, rather than two adjacent wings, constituted a hearse. He describes this as broad in front and narrow in flank, as for example, if there were 25, 30, 35 or more archers in front, the flanks did consist but of seven or eight ranks at the most. And the reason was this. If they had placed any more ranks than seven or eight, the hind ranks of archers would have lost a great deal of ground, in their volleys of their arrows at their enemies, as also the sight of the hind ranks would have been hindered by so many formed ranks. He adds that such hearses were placed either before the front of their armed footmen, or else in wings upon the corners of their battles, or sometimes both in front and wings. The particular advantages of this formation, of course were that attacking troops with their heads down, in the face of the arrow storm tended to veer away from the archers, and were thus channeled towards the waiting men at arms. This enabled the archers to enfilade the enemy, as he approached and engaged the men at arms. Geoffrey Le Baker specifically says, that by being placed on the wings of each battle, the archers did not hinder the men at arms, nor did they meet the enemy head on, but could catch them in the crossfire. This also allowed a reasonable amount of flexibility. To quote J. E. Morris, the archers are not to be regarded as animated dummies, they could spread out in lines parallel to their men at arms, gall the enemy as he approached, or by their galling volleys compel him to approach, and then fall back into their wedge-like formations as his charge was pressed home. A continues, concentrated hail of arrows could therefore be laid down, 